Good morning, adventurers! I haven't had my coffee, I don't have makeup, my hair is not done, so do not judge me. But what I'm doing right now is I'm actually doing the little things that are behind the scenes usually you guys don't see. I am repacking my day pack. I am putting up my electrical devices. The reason why I'm doing this now is because I'm about to be going into DC and I'm going to have to park at the metro station. That's the best way to go anywhere whenever you're in a major city is to use the public transport. And even though it's patrolled, you don't want to have things that are just going to make your car look like a target to someone. There are some dishonest people out there, so obviously we don't want to encourage them to come into our little bubble of travel. So what's in the pack, you ask? Spray, contact drops, hand sanitizer, lip gloss, small lotion, um, of course my camera, a GoPro. So I look better now. I'm actually at the Greenbelt station, which is the closest to my campsite. But I'm a little confused because I'm trying to figure out where exactly I'm supposed to go. I'm trying to find a parking spot and then afterwards we'll be seeking out where. That has been clarified. A really nice man who was getting out of his car probably thought I was crazy. But um, I walked up to him and asked him, where do I get my metro card? Which building is it? And he pointed me in the right direction. That was complicated to purchase, but after we got it taken care of, we have a pass and we'll just load it up as we go. It comes with eight bucks on it, $2 for the card, and we're in. As soon as we made it off of the metro, we get to immediately see the Navy Memorial, which is pretty cool. It is a nice little Navy man, and there's this huge globe. I don't know if you can see that, but it is directly in front of the National Archives. So, stop number one, maybe, or we could keep exploring and get closer to where all the action happens. While we're waiting on the crosswalk, I think our first stop is going to be the Natural History, which is right there. We just have to get over to it. We made it. So we're about to go into natural history. There's no gum, no food, nothing like that available. However, you can bring with you a bottle of water. So that's what we're going to do. Have our bottle of water, lots of photos, and uh, see what we can't take pictures of and find. Up we go. In this room, they do a presentation of how the continents split because of the tectonic plates. And it's pretty interesting, but if you come in, sit on the far wall, because if you sit on the closest wall, there's people walking past you a lot, which is kind of what happened to me. Looking around, it's almost overwhelming how much information is here. So you really almost have to have like a purpose and a principle for where you're going. A lot like the other museums that we've been to, they have like these little interactive areas where you can push something and it goes to a different screen. This one is a quiz, so let's see if we're smart enough to pass. so funny about this is every morning I have a motivational quote that I look at and today it was about the great white shark. Yep. 
so I'm a shark. Stuff like this is why whenever I travel, I tell people, pick up after yourself because it affects the animals around you. That's why whenever I leave a campsite, I always clean up my campsite. And usually when I get to a campsite, if there's any trash, I pick it up before I even start the day. All of the items that were used in that were all found in the ocean and otherwise could have harmed animals. So they're taking something really negative and turning it into a super positive by raising awareness, but also by rallying funds by showing this art. It's pretty awesome. Our next stop is the Ocean Explorer Theater. We're gonna go see what kind of information we can get from there. It's really cool. That exhibit said that because my legs were shorter, strides were shorter, I guess my legs just never grew because that's my average stride. <laughs> adapts to our environment also so for example those in hot climates like this guy had longer legs and were a little bit taller in body but narrow and then this guy over here from the cold climate was not as tall whenever he's an adult he's more squatty to the ground shorter legs and uh, more thick body probably to keep warm exhibit where you can actually see what you would look like as an early human so I think I'm gonna have to wait in line and do this just to see. What would you look like as an early human? Line up your face with the markings on the screen. Press take your picture when your eyes and mouth are lined up and we'll count down. Okay be sure to look right at the camera. Taking your picture in three, two, one. Ooh. You are now Australopithecus africanus. Would you like your photo sent to you? Well, it looks like if I was ruling the country, we would survive. That's positive. I get to step into the cold space to see how cold weather animals react. like their blubber and what keeps them warm. I can see how. It's basically like those fun doodles 
if you squish it together and you were to put like 20 of them together and it wouldn't be that squishy anymore, that's what it feels like. That's what blubber feels like. Who would have thunk it? Leave it to me to find a bunny everywhere I go. I'm gonna go into South America. Yep, we're gonna see what they have there. This should be interesting. I love sloths. Have you ever seen one in person? They are the coolest things because they just move so slow. Oh my goodness. Look at this. It's a Pekka. And it looks like this Pekka is actually getting hunted. So this, it's a pretty substantial jaguar. Look at him. Next up, Australia. Down under. Have you ever wondered how a koala can hang on to things so well? Like this guy? Well, this is why. They have two thumbs. Wow. I think I stumbled upon the safari. So I think we're going to Africa now. And uh, everything here is bigger. Much bigger. been here an hour and a half and haven't even seen one whole floor yet. We're about to go back into the ocean, this grand entrance, and try to figure out what's on the other side of the ocean area before we even get a chance to go up to the next floor. I could be here all day. the National Geographic shop in Caesars and saw some of these amazing prints that you could get but here in the Smithsonian instead of having just the amazing prints they actually have the winners of their photo contest these things are awesome I only wish I could take photos like this
From here, we move into Objects of Wonder, which is, according to this, the heart and soul of the museum. The exhibit behind me actually says a lot of the artifacts and things like that that they get from confiscations of illegal trade end up in museums like this, which are so important because then the rest of us get to see them instead of them being illegally traded and sold for profit, which a lot of things like animals and Indian artifacts, things like that, that's what they're talking about. Other items like these come from private collectors who make a donation or put them on loan with the Smithsonian's so that people can enjoy them and then not just be shoved off into somebody's back room of their amazing house. Or a lot of times people will share things that they've inherited or been passed down as well. This area contains everything from pottery where you see beside me to this, which is fascinating. It has all the different kinds of birds and the size and appearance of the eggs that they lay. It's not something that you would find in a comparison in most places. So the fact that they have such interesting exhibits all grouped together makes this place just really, really interesting. For example, ostrich egg. Versus, look at this little guy, it's a hummingbird, it's so tiny. So what was that you're asking? That was a hummingbird bone. And this exhibit shows that there is a direct correlation between dinosaurs and everything as small as even a hummingbird. This is a dinosaur. Much larger, obviously, but the shape is the same, and that is what makes them have that weird common link. You know how during the 60s and 70s the smiley face was a big deal? Well, they weren't the first one to make it a big deal. This came from Alaska in the 1870s, and well, I think they had the market on smiley face cornered way before. And speaking of dinosaurs, yeah, time to go in. The interesting thing about what they're doing in there is they're actually unearthing the fossils, cleaning them up and putting them where they can be categorized, tagged, and also used. So this exhibit is really unique because it shows those animals that are no longer around and are completely extinct, those who are endangered, and those who are in a high population that we don't have to worry about going extinct anytime soon. One of the most interesting things about this, they have a dodo bird. I remember whenever I was little, we always heard about the dodo bird, and I never knew what it was, and it was the easiest to remember because it's called a dodo bird. But it's one of many species that have been extinct over years based on climate change, migration patterns, the effects of all sorts of different factors, including humans. So let's check these out. Remember that Jurassic Park part where we saw the T-Rex for the first time and his little bitty arms and we're freaked out because he was kind of scary? Well, I can see why. His teeth are huge. Look at this. Could you honestly say, if you saw that right behind you, you wouldn't be scared? Yeah, you would be. Set up like a video game. 
So let's hope it plays that way. We're going to find out how to become a fossil and play. I think I want to be a vertebrate because that had a backbone. This game was originally introduced in 1986 to the Smithsonian, hence the video game style. And it is really, really quite simple. They've just kind of revamped it a little bit so that it is more modern on the outside. But it allows you to pick your animal, pick where you live, and based on your decisions, you find out if you, in fact, would become a fossil. I was a shark, I live deep offshore. I had 3% chance of becoming a fossil. This exhibit is really interesting. Also probably one of the more crowded ones. It's the bones of pretty much everything. In the early man exhibit, you can see some comparisons from humans and monkeys, but this one is perhaps even more interesting because there's a man, there's a monkey, there's a monkey, and their bones are about the same length from their fingers to their toes to their arms to their thighs. And next is butterflies and plants. And then it keeps going. Forever and ever and ever. Did you know that the ancient Egyptians mummified like everything? We only think of it as the mummy, like the person, the mummy, but no, animals too. When I was little, I used to collect rocks, and none of them were as beautiful as these, but you couldn't tell me they weren't. And uh, so this is kind of a little guilty pleasure for me. Look at this. Another interactive exhibit. This time it is about inside the earth what causes the pressure and you can hit any one of these buttons and then it lights it up on the corresponding screen as to the action or the part that it happens to be well that's positive Basically, what feeds a volcano is what I could make cookies with. That's kind of creepy to know that, but that's a good way to be able to illustrate things that are kind of unfathomable, things that we don't think about whenever you go deeper and deeper into the crust. So, good to know.
Hope Diamond, Harry Winston. Seems like they go together well. so you can actually plug in your device and charge up so that you won't run out of power either while you're here or while you're moving on to the next. So I'm gonna save my power pack, which I've been using, and recharge it a little bit and charge my phone, sit here for a few moments, and then move on. Have a trip to go to at three. But that was the Natural History Museum. I hope you enjoyed it. And check out tomorrow's adventure. It's gonna be interesting.